So without further ado, uh, we are going to kick it off. If you take nothing else from this talk today, hopefully uh, it's an appreciation for how incredibly cool and awesome bird migration really is. Um, truly is one of these just amazing ecological phenomenons and all sorts of birds complete, you know, massive, incredible migrations, you know, hawks, cranes, ducks, shorebirds, uh, and of course the focus of today's talk is songbird migration. Um, we're talking songbird migration in North America. We're usually referring to a group called neotropical migrants. Think of that as birds that breed sort of in northern forests and boreal forests, and they are going to migrate all the way down to Central and South America. And to sort of highlight this and lay it out in lavender and just sort of photos, we're talking about birds going from, you know, really lush, green, resource-rich areas in the summer here, you know, somewhere up north. And then when they're wintering, they're in these nice, lush, resource-rich areas, you know, like a tropical forest here in the non-breeding wintering period. Uh, but on migration, you never know what you're going to get. Could be awesome, could be very desolate. And, you know, they got to do this journey in a very short amount of time. We're talking thousands of miles. So there's a lot of very unique challenges to an animal when we're talking about big time migration. And just to highlight a few of those, uh, body condition is a big one, the individual body condition of the animal. Um, you know, I highlight here a black pole warbler. These guys are like 13, 14 grams. And in fall, they in fact will depart from somewhere in the mid-Atlantic do a nonstop flight across the ocean and end up in South America. So as you can imagine, the body needs to be in really, really good shape and condition in order to complete that flight. Um, very closely tied to that is while on migration, what about your diet? You know, the, the fuel for migration in birds is, is typically fat. Uh, for, you know, like humans, we think of our long distance exercise, that's usually carbs kind of fueling it. It is fat in birds. And can you get enough fat on the way on, along your migration? Uh, to fuel up, but also I put recovery in here that obviously includes resting, but recovery within your diet. Uh, what is the quality of the food that you're getting? Is it, is it more than just the fuel? Does it have things like antioxidants to repair damage that, you know, intense long distance exercise can create? So a lot of challenges with diet along the way. Weather's a big one, uh, seems kind of obvious, but you know, a hurricane's not very conducive for migration, but when we're talking in fall, you know, songbirds are, uh, neotropical songbirds are typically nocturnal migrants, so they are always going to look to take advantage of tailwinds. So in fall migration, we're talking about north winds. That's usually the sign uh, when a lot of birds are going to go head south and take off. A lot of birds, when there's a south wind or like a headwind and typically a stronger wind, most birds are not going to commence migration. They're going to stay put where they are. So that's just important to remember. And lastly, fall is kind of unique in that there's this experience factor. Um, you know, over the summer, the preceding summer, we have all these birds that were just newly hatched. They're, they're new arrivals on the scene. We call these hatcher birds. Uh, they've never migrated before. They've only known the little area they, they grew up in their little nest. Um, so that's a, that's a challenge in and of itself to travel across the continent ever, having never seen anything like that before. And as you might guess, the older birds that have sort of been around the block a couple of times, uh, they do stand, in fact, a better chance of successfully completing migration. So the, the huge key for songbirds that we're really sort of discovering is this dietary aspect. And, you know, when it comes to diet, we're talking about fat. Fat is so incredibly important to migratory songbirds. It is the main fuel for migration. And the last 20 years has just seen this incredible explosion in literature and research on sort of dietary physiology and physiology as it relates to migration. And we're not just talking about adding fat for few loads, we're talking about to the, the different elements of fat, the different types of fat, the quality of, of the foods that you are eating and how that relates to all sorts of processes going on with these birds as they are exercising. So it's really an incredible time to, to be looking into this stuff and we're learning so much at such a rapid pace. So with fat and the food you're eating on migration being so important, this concept of stopover for migration becomes really essential. And to define stopover, uh, just think of it as, you know, a bird has commenced migration, it's left its breeding grounds and it's heading to the wintering grounds. For simplicity's sake, basically anytime it's not actively flying south. So the bird's, you know, flying, 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 it's doing a long distance migration and then it stops somewhere, like that's stopover during migration. Um, so what, what are the elements that make good stopover? Well, food, as you might've guessed, that's gonna be kind of the theme here. Food's a really, really important one. Uh, sort of tied to that too is the habitat structure. 
So uh, the more variable the structure tends to be pretty good for neotropical songbirds on migration. Uh, it offers not only sort of diverse feeding opportunities, um, but also, you know, just cover and protection. You know, if you, if you have you know, shrubs and trees and grass, you can kind of get away and, and stay safe. Uh, and then location. Um, and this is location in relation to the migratory pathway of the species you're talking about. So I highlight here, uh, Cape May, New Jersey is a very famous uh, stopover as is like High Island on the Gulf Coast. Uh, and just, you know, they're important and they're, you know, unique because they're surrounded by ocean. It's this big barrier. So things like that are really important in defining and identifying stopover locations. So let's think locally here. What about Nebraska? Well, we're actually all, I would imagine, relatively familiar with the concept of stopover Nebraska because we have really famous ones in like Sandhill Cranes or waterfowl is, is huge and shorebirds in the rainwater basins and in the sandhills. So those, those are these critical spots for those species during migration. Um, and that's great and we should you know, keep, it that way, keep it that way, hopefully. But we're talking about a totally different suite of birds here that can't rely on a grassland or a wetland or this big you know, expanse. We're talking about birds in the very far Eastern corridor of the state, sort of much closer to the Missouri River. Uh, so Joel and I got to thinking, where exactly in the state are we going to find a uh, potential stopover for these neotropical birds? And we got to thinking about the wildlife management areas in the eastern part of our state. And, you know, a lot of these have that diverse habitat structure. Uh, you're tending to have a little more shrubs and forbs, things like that. It's, um, and, you know, typically, too, we're hope, hoping they're, they're, we have some native forbs and grasses in here. And again, we're talking about areas in these far eastern uh, agriculturally dominated uh, or like an urban landscape, kind of ex-urban, suburban uh, landscape areas where we're not talking about, you know, central Nebraska and grasslands. We're talking about areas that are, have been already converted completely. Um, and so if you have these sort of spots in these relative deserts of ag land and, and urban land, you know, all, all the elements are there for stopover, but nobody's formally looked at it before yet until right now in this talk, in this next slide, <laughs> when we formalize the question with, uh, are the wildlife management areas in eastern Nebraska, do they function as adequate stopover sites for migratory songbirds? And so to investigate this question, the main thing that we were looking at is individual body condition of these migratory birds. Um, and the way that kind of breaks down to sort of hypothesis approach is comparing birds that would be arriving at these WMAs meaning, you know, we had a night of north winds, conditions are very conducive for migration. Uh, these birds, when we catch them the following morning, they should have pretty low fat. They would have spent most of their fuel reserves flying from whatever distance it was overnight. Now, the real kicker here is that if we have good stopover, the birds that we're catching on the south wind nights, i.e. the nights where there's no movement, birds are not going to be migrating long distances, those birds will be on stopover, they should have increased fat and therefore improve body condition. So that's really the thing we're looking for is the birds that were not moving, that were on stopover at Conestoga, were they improving their body condition by gaining more fat in the area? So where we conducted this study was just outside of Lincoln uh, at Conestoga Wildlife Management Area. And we did your typical songbird banding with mist nets. Um, and we had three nets and, you know, we were mostly in like a shrubby grassland edge area. Um, you know, we didn't have huge capacity here, but we, we got a nice, nice variety of, of locations that birds would be in, in the general habitat. Uh, things you're looking at when, when you're doing the songbird banding, uh, catch rate, just uh, how many birds are you catching given your effort, species composition, that's kind of a given. And within that, uh, the demographics, you know, the age of the birds that you're catching. Uh, for species that you can sex in the fall, you know, are, is there any sort of sex differential? And then the big one, again, fat. Uh, so the way you are checking and measuring fat on these songbirds during migration, um, birds are great in that they store a lot of their fat right under the skin. And uh, so it, it's just above the chest and below the throat. It's called the furculum. And what you do is you, you blow apart the feathers as best you can. And you're actually looking at the fat itself. Uh, you can see it in this photo. It's that like gross yellow blob right under the skin there. Um, and there's a scoring system for, you know, like goes from no fat at all to oh my gosh, there's so much fat on this bird kind of thing. So it takes a little bit of getting used to, but once, once you're kind of trained on it, uh, this is our main measurement that we are focusing on 
for these migratory birds. And, and this is going to be what's telling us because a lot of studies have validated that not only is this indicative of, you know, the condition of the bird itself, but fat really is a, a really good determinant of if there's going to be a successful uh, migration for these birds. So again, comparing, looking at fat score between different winds, uh, we checked out a few other variables too, just to sort of see if there's any other factors at play, like, you know, date, time of the day when we're catching the birds, species group, stuff like that. And we're only concerned uh, with the migratory birds. So uh, with passive songbird banding, you're just going to catch whatever. So there are resident species, you know, like cardinals and chickadees that you're going to catch. They're not on migration. They're just uh, hanging out at their house, <laughs> more or less. So uh, we weren't really analyzing any, anything with them. Uh, and the other trick too is, uh, for those that know kind of birds in Nebraska, there's a fair number of species that are migratory, but may have actually bred like right around Conestoga, if not at the WMA itself. But the way you sort of tease out those individuals is just by checking for molt, particularly body molt. Um, Molting is a really intense physiological process as well for birds, and they can't really do both things. It's just too ener energetically demanding. So we, we, we were careful to sort of uh, be, be on, on uh, making sure we weren't counting birds that weren't migrating, essentially. And statistically speaking, you know, we didn't um, reinvent the wheel here. Pretty basic single factor GLMs on just looking at fat score and then the impact of, again, wind direction, uh, date, time of capture, things like that. So what did we find? Here are the results. So uh, we operated basically end of August, early September through mid-October in both 2020 and 2021 and had a little over 230 net hours. And for those that have maybe done some migration banding before, you may think, you know, that's not a ton, but uh, we, we actually did get plenty of birds and it was a good result for the capacity we had. We banded over 480 birds and 39 different species, which was already kind of stands out as like a really big, that, wow, all right. <laughs> uh, so that, that was impressive. Um, and we did have legacy species of conservation need in there. Uh, we had a couple tier two species, the Savannah Sparrow and Swamp Sparrow. We caught a couple of each of those. The real highlight uh, was the Black-billed Cuckoo, which is a tier one species. And tier one species are tier one for a reason. They're very unusual and very rare. You don't run into them a lot. Uh, regionally, Black-billed Cuckoo numbers have been on the decline. So to just see that that species was in fact using the WMA was a, another really good sort of anecdotal sign. We caught lots and lots of Nashville warblers. That was our number one species. And that's that bird in the uh, top right corner there, uh, followed closely by common yellow throats, another warbler that's the bottom right there. Uh, and, our, and our big catches were usually mid-September is when we kind of had the big numbers and, and big diversity. Speaking of diversity of species, I'm just gonna throw up some slides that are sort of a photo collage of, of some of the species we caught. And you know, the reason I'm doing this is, I mean, birds, they are pretty cool and aesthetically pleasing and all that, but it's to just highlight again, this species diversity that we were catching at this one site with only three nets, you know, but here's, you know, six different species of warblers. Uh, we had four different types of vireos, flycatchers. And again, we're catching multiple individuals of each of these species. Moving on to the sparrows, uh, the gold stars, those are our legacy birds, uh, Savannah sparrow, in the left corner, swamp sparrow in the center there. Uh, and then just miscellaneous whatever birds. Uh, the cuckoo, of course, gets that big, big gold star. That was a highlight. But, you know, there's, there's buntings, there's woodpeckers, uh, wrens, kinglets, goldfinches. I mean, and this is by, you know, this is not the extensive <laughs> photo list of, of birds we caught, but it just gives you an idea of all the different types of species that were utilized in this one little area of kind of like shrubby grassland. So it was really cool to see that um, at our catch site. Getting to the fat of the matter, sort of the meat on the bones, if you will, uh, looking at the average fat scores, uh, comparing again birds after migrating those north wind nights versus birds that were on stopover. We did see that low fat after the north wind nights, um, but the good news, we also saw the higher, much higher fat score uh, on average after the south wind nights. And when put through the statistical wash that did uh, that was, in fact, not only our best scoring model, but it was, in fact, a significant factor. So um, the birds that we caught after the south wind nights, and again, those birds were presumably on stopover, they had, on average, 50% higher fat than the birds that we would catch arriving to the WMA. So great to see that that was sort of, uh, I guess, the result we, we could hope for. Uh, things like species group 
and the dates were also kind of interesting. And I'm going to throw up, this is a bit of a busy figure, but just to break it down a little, this is kind of everything going on within the system here. Uh, fat score on your y-axis. J-Day is Julian date. That's just like time of the year, essentially. So this is September, October. Um, and what you can see here is that there's a general trend as the season moves along of higher fat. But the real thing to look at is, again, that orange regression line. That's those south wind nights. That blue regression line is the north wind nights. And you can see that they are on distinctly different tracks there. Again, just, just demonstrating how, regardless of the group of species that we're talking about, these birds did, in fact, have way more fat after those south wind nights. And to sort of eliminate winds from it, we noticed an interesting trend. Uh, these are just regressions of different groups of species with fat over time. Uh, and you can see like flycatchers and, you know, the warblers and the others, um, they all have that pretty steady upward regression as time goes on. Sparrows, which are the dashed gold line, um, seem to have lower fat as the season progressed. And I think too, if, if you saw some of the species real quick on that, that slide of the sparrows, a lot of those that we were catching are, are kind of winter in like Southeast Nebraska or very close. So we may have been catching birds that weren't necessarily, they were very close to ending their migration. So when we took sparrows out of the equation, uh, the results become even more dramatic. Uh, yes, there's an increase as the season progresses, but you can see again, that real big dichotomy between uh, how much fat the birds have after those south wind nights versus those north wind nights. So um, really, really interesting and good to see. Here it is again, just in that box plot format, um, much higher fat after those south wind nights uh, without sparrows in the equation here compared to the north wind nights. So bringing that back to our general hypothesis, gonna catch birds that were on migration with low fat. That's how kind of the world should work, especially with Nebraska, you know, we're right on that north-south line. But, you know, again, that real kicker being when these birds were on stopover, they had more fat, they had increased fat. Um, and you can imagine sort of the alternatives here. Yeah, most of these songbirds should have pretty low fat uh, when it comes to the north wind nights. Again, they, they just spent the whole night moving. That, that's sort of how, how things should go. Uh, but the south wind nights, you know, we could have caught birds that had, you know, no statistical difference between fat scores when they're on stopover. And that would probably mean something like, you know, they're hanging out in eastern Nebraska and they're just doing what they do, but they're not really improving their body condition. It could have been even worse. They could have had lower fat scores than the birds that were moving, which would mean that we may have like an ecological trap or just birds should not stop over at all in Nebraska. Fortunately, we had uh, the, the opposite. Birds were in fact improving their body condition. Got about a minute or so left there. Thank you, Cody. Uh, so wrapping up, um, what does this all mean? Well, we think that Conestoga and likely the other WMAs sort of around Lincoln and Eastern Nebraska are these very good stopover sites. And that's just by virtue, again, the diversity of species we were catching, that increased body condition that they had. There's a photo of my hand covered in poop. And this is just kind of, again, anecdotal proof in the pudding that obviously it's mostly berries. The birds were eating lots of food, clearly, <laughs> at the WMA. So they, they were putting on that fat. And, you know, this management out, out east that, you know, you're in this agricultural landscape. Uh, if you have sort of this diverse structure going on of, of tends to be early successional, and we see this in other areas as well. Uh, this is beneficial to migratory songbirds. And better yet, we know that this is beneficial to multiple species at different times of the year. Um, in the spring, we were in fact catching woodcock at Conestoga and other Eastern WMAs. So we know it's great for things like woodcock uh, during the spring and potentially summer. And the fact that it's really helping out these migratory songbirds in the fall, it, it's just great to see that kind of management and, you know, care of the land and these sort of like urban agriculture areas uh, really working out for everyone's benefit. So great project, great fun. That is all I have. And I would be glad to answer any questions you may have. <laughs>